What's up, y'all? It's your girl, Dr. CBS, a.k.a. The Last Dope Intellectual. And I just want to give a huge shout out to the Renegade Culture Podcast. 100 episodes is so amazing, such a huge milestone. And I cannot wait to see what y'all come up with in the next 100 episodes, keeping it real, keeping it interesting and keeping it for the people. So I'm a fan and keep up the good work. Peace. What's up? This is Tori from Atlanta Influences Everything. Just want to give a stupid shout out to Renegade Culture on 100 episodes. That's a milestone, baby. Keep going. Two years ago, a friend of mine asked me to say some MC rhymes. So I said these rhymes I'm, I'm about, about to say. The rhyme was deaf and then it went, went this way. 100! <laughs> Welcome to the Centennial Show. This is True. the Centennial. True. Renegade culture, 100 fucking episodes. You know what I'm Close saying? to three years. Three years, son. Hey, Who congratulations. knew? They Can't said we wouldn't make it, and then we're here. 100 yes. years in? Yes. 100, 100 episodes? Well, 100 episodes. We're, 100 years in, we're gonna be here for 100 years. Okay. Because <laughs> it's the best damn podcast in the land. He said that shit. And you know that. In the universe. In the universe. Legal ease and shit. You know what I'm he sound like an attorney right there. Right. This is the best That's damn show my that I've ever not, had. My voice ain't like that. It's okay, not. cool. It's more Malcolm like. Anyway, Malcolm. Yep, yep. Okay. Yo, this is Kamal Malcolm. <laughs> this is Kamal Malcolm. Malcolm Franklin. Yo, 100 year podcast and I'm with. Hey, my name is Kalani Jamachanga. Now, why are you the calm one tonight? I was going to call it a word. I'm back. Yeah, oh, I mean, you know, know it's all good. I mean, you, you keep saying 100 years and shit. Keep fucking me up. Oh, because that's how old you are. Yo, <laughs> who we got back here? Yo, I go by the name of the Ed Doctor and okay. on my side, Minister Server, along with. It's your boy, Jai. Yeah, My man yeah. Jai High ja, in the building. Jai ja High. That's his, that gotta be his new name. Jai ja High. Ja high. Uh, I get high. Okay. So, yo, okay. it's 100. You know what I'm saying? What we do? Grab your bottle, oh, son. Hey, we I got the time to pop the bottle. Usually I don't drink because you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I'm a distinguished uh -huh. gentleman here. Uh -huh. But anyway, fuck what you heard. Renegade coach in the building. Bacca. Bacca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's how we know oh, y'all this bitch, man. Anyway. <laughs> Wait. Oh, shit. oh we, got, we got a cake. Oh, oh look at that. Okay. Look at that. Straight from Kroger's. Cake. Yeah. Oh, whoa. You're, not a, you're not a stripper or nothing, right? So get, get the fuck off. Okay, you know okay. <laughs> get off the mic. You know what I'm saying? Word. Like, word. word. You, got the, you got fancy cake up in here. Yo. cake going over What's that? Zero, 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 zero tilted and shit. Five to like zero tilted, back, yo. Like, you know what Are I'm you saying? ready? On three. One. Two. Oh, I thought you were going to try to throw this in my face, man. Yo, wait, 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 oh, wait, that wait, been wait, 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 <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, yo, um, so we got, we got a, a show tonight. Yo. yo, we got a crazy show tonight, yo. Okay. We got an exclusive interview. An exclusive interview. Yeah, but before we do that, okay, I think we got to we got to update our show a little bit. Can oh, you do, can we you still do the honors? In the past, right? I think we're living in the oh, past. Oh, okay. Where, where, where? This is all about. The I'm looking future, real so. good. It seemed like um. Uh, uh, Ah, oh, like yes. Ah, you know oh, there we go. Okay, now we're back, back in real future time. Game. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, and that's now. a good thing, because the guest tonight is somebody who is prestigious. Okay. A movement icon. Definitely an icon. We have an exclusive interview with Word. the one and only Jaleel Matakin. Oh, man, listen. Y'all don't even... Man, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck what you heard. What you about to see, what you about to witness is some real deal shit, right? Mm -hmm. This brother right here is a former political prisoner. When I say former political prisoner, I'm talking about released less than a year ago. That's right. You know what I'm saying? It's a few months ago. I'm going to tell you something that's, that's, that's 100. This man right here was locked up for 49 years. That's right. 49 years. He got locked up less than a year before I was born. Excuse me, less than a year after I was born. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even like six, seven months and shit mm -hmm. when his brother was born. I mean, when his brother was uh, uh, locked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So he's a real uh, warrior. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He's a real trooper. A hero of the movement. I mean, the man been locked up since he was 19 years old. That's right. That's right. That's and right. they still tried to keep him up in that motherfucker. So and we're going to get into all of that. When we talk to him, we're going to get into his movement history. No doubt. What was Black like, Panther Party. Time like Black in Liberation the joint. Army. Black yes. Liberation Army. All that right. kind of stuff. And what he's trying to do now. What he thinks of today's movement. You know, in a little bit of time he's been out, Word. you know, what's going on and what he's getting into. Yo, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited because on the real, this is a brother, one of the, the, the OGs that I studied and researched for years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, back in the day, I'm going to say back in the day because of the fact you got all these new activists, they don't know what the fuck time <laughs> is. We, we, we would write our political prisoners. That's we right. still do write our political prisoners. But we write them to let them know that we still, you know, 
we still That's remember right. what's going on, you know what I mean? And if we got support for them. A lot of times these new niggas, yeah. they people get locked up, they forget about it. They forget about it. You know yeah, yeah. be like, yo, free such and such. That shit lasts for about two weeks. No, you're right. Or to 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 their record drop and that yeah. shit's over. You know what I'm saying? And they forget they existed. Yeah. So you know And in my case, like Jaleel was one of the New York prisoners. So I got to New go York. see him. Yes. Like like several times, visit him in prison. He was part of like this the circuit of political prisoners that we tried to support. So it's an honor to have him out and to have him on our show. Word. Um, and then we have a musical guest is? Oh, man, Ken the Misfits. Uh -oh. Spell it right here. Uh-oh. All right. Dope artist. What? I just ran into him. He's on uh, the Movement label. All right. You know what I'm saying? All right. Rolling my man Blue. They said Blue's like the Joe Jackson slash oh, Quincy Jones. Oh, the Joe Jackson. You need beating mother? Get the fuck you out of here. Better get, get that song out of your If you don't get that oh. motherfucking song together, you know what I'm saying? Right. You sit over there in that cool shit uh -huh. like, so good. You be like, eat the cake, Andy, man. <laughs> so this cake right here, you're going to make Kamal eat this motherfucker before we leave I don't know shit. about that, Blue. You're going to make oh, your man. ass eat the whole fucking cake. Yo, I think we got, a, we got a big announcement, too. We got a big announcement? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we do got a big announcement. That's right. Almost forgot. How can I'm you a fly that? motherfucker. That's the announcement. <laughs> Yo, what else we got to say? Yo, so uh, next week, Wednesday, okay. we are going to be doing a special show. Live broadcast. Live broadcast. We're yes. teaming up with a partner of ours. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think y'all have y'all around social media. Y'all seen a little bit, a little preview, a little peek, a little peek know, under, you know what I'm saying? Know. They don't know. So, like, stay tuned. Major announcement. We join, you're going Voltron on y'all. We're joining forces. We're going to be doing some big things in black media space. So just stay tuned for that. Word. Fuck what you heard. You know what I'm saying? It's Renegade Culture. We be back. So shout out to my brothers at Renegade Culture Pack uh, Podcast. Shout out to Server, DJ Ear Doctor, and Kamal. God bless you, brothers. Fuck Kalanji. Um, yeah, Kalanji. You know what, Kalanji? I'm going to tell you, brother. I love you to death, but man, I, I've been praying against the success of this bullshit-ass podcast since y'all launched it. You know, every, every day you change up. One day you're a revolutionary, next day you vote in Democrat. How, is, how can you be a revolutionary and vote Democrat? But all that being aside, all joking aside, I love all you brothers. Congratulations on your 100th episode. Um, I pray for your success. I want y'all to be the biggest podcast ever. I want y'all to be the, well, I don't want y'all to be the biggest radio show ever because I need my show to be the biggest radio show ever. But I want y'all to be the second biggest radio show ever, but the biggest podcast ever in the history of podcasts. I pray for nothing but success for all of y'all brothers. Um, I love you from the bottom of my heart. But seriously, you can't call yourself revolutionaries and every election day, y'all vote Democrat. Like for real, for real. Either you're gonna be a revolutionary or you're not. But you can't be a revolutionary and tell people to vote Democrat. If you wanna be real revolutionaries, come to my side of the fence and vote Republican. That's real revolutionary. That's black revolutionary shit right there. Congratulations, brother, I love you. Oh, bust my shirt. Only a select few know what that address is. One day y'all will learn. Peace. Peace, everyone. This is Tierney Sharif from the African Esquire TV YouTube show. I just want to wish the Renegade Culture podcast a happy 100th episode. Continue to spread information, continue to share joy and laughs, and I look forward to continuing to watch and listen to you guys. Savvy Renegade Coaches in the building. Yo, we back with our 100th episode. Yo, Yo, episode 100. Bam. Who knew? Who Man, knew? Man, I knew, because oh, shit. I'm Kalanji uh, Jamachanga. Oh, true that, true. And who are you, sir? Kamal K. Franklin, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to be here with you. Uh, 100. 100. Another 100 to go, you yes, know what I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. I don't know if we do a whole 100 with you. That's oh, damn, like, no. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's only fitting. That's right. For our 100th episode to bring in an OG. An OG. A vet. Yeah. And to give you all something exclusive. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Exclusive. That's right. This is his first podcast. Okay. You know what I'm saying? His first interview show that he's doing since okay. his release. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's heavy. So we got Brother Jaleel Montekeen. Yes. Former Black Panther or veteran Black Panther. Veteran Panther. Party member. Yes. Member of the Black Liberation Army. Brother Jaleel was arrested in 1971. He 1971. spent 49 years locked down. Um, he was a cause celeb for many of us as a political prisoner. True indeed. Somebody who we fought for, who we cared about, who we visited. Um, and when he got out, you know, the celebrations happened all across the movement because Jaleel is a real hero of our struggle. He's part of the New York Three. That's right. You know that's what I'm right. saying? In New York Three, for us coming up in movement and struggle, I'm 50, but coming up in, in, in my, for my teenage years, that was one of the main crews or the main... Uh, a group of political prisoners that yeah. we're pushing for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we are honored to have this brother on here. 
I was talking before we was talking before uh, before we started recording. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he had been locked up since I was about eight months old. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So my whole life, that's right, up until less than eight months ago. You know what I'm saying? That's this right. brother's been locked up. <clears throat> so it's an honor to have. That's right. Jalil Mutakin in the building. Jalil! Hey. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Kamal. Good morning, Jalaji. How are your brothers? Man. We're doing good, man. We're doing real good today, man. We, we trying to be our own liberators, like you said. That's right. You and you look mean? fantastic. That's what it's all about, bro. You know I'm teaching a class on that on my book, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we heard. We heard. heard. Yeah, yeah. It's been going good. I had the first two classes, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, it went pretty well. So <clears throat> I'm looking forward for the next five more classes, five more weeks. Of and glasses, you know, dealing with the book from cover to cover. For, for, for folks who are not familiar with the book because of the fact that, you know, our show, it, it's, it's uh, political, but at the same time, we try to reach the masses. You know what I yeah. mean? We, we're not caught up on, uh, you know, stiff politics. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We try to go out there amongst the people. So for folks who are not familiar with your book, tell them about it. We're on Liberated. Well, um, it's a book that I first started off as a pamphlet. That was called the, for, the North, uh, for the Liberation of North America. And I first wrote that one back in 1979, I believe it was. I had just got a, a parole from uh, San Quentin, and they brought me to, uh, to New York. And I was up in uh, uh, Clinton and then Attica. And I uh, finished completing the, the For the Liberation of North America. And uh, <clears throat> so it was a good book. It was a good pamphlet. You know, it was about, about 57, 56 pages. And, <clears throat> and so it was distributed. It was, got some good, you know... Uh, 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 feedback from people on that, and uh, but you know over the years, you know my my ideas changed. You know I grew, I matured. You know um, so my ideas kind of developed uh, as a process, and so then I began to write the the uh, for for our own liberation. Uh, uh, we own liberators, and I wrote one. It uh, first was published in uh, 2020, and then it was uh, republished in uh, 2010. So the book is uh, about 21 years old. And it still resonates with the people and with the movement today, and uh, so it's a uh, it's, it's a good book. It's, it's a, uh, unfortunately it's out of print. Only way people can get it is on ebooks, for what I, for what I understand. Uh, but uh, after 20 years, you can find that what was written back then it resonates to what's going on today. Mm -hmm. You know, it so seems we get like into uh, uh, you know what I envisioned back then mm -hmm. uh, it's come to manifest manifestation, come to fruition uh, today. Uh, the the social economic and political conditions mm -hmm. today are, are ripe for what I was talking about back then, and so people are finding it uh, something that they are attaching to. Uh, they have requested that I teach the teach the book, mm -hmm. and, and so that's what I started doing uh, uh, Monday, I okay. know uh, Tuesday. That's so what I started doing on the ninth, and uh, so it's, uh, it's it's a good book. It's cool. a good book. I, I hope people get a, at least get it on 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 the ebook. Yeah, yeah, let, let me jump in. Let me jump in on you. So, Jaleel, we wanted to get a little bit into your political history. Uh, obviously, as a young man, you joined the Panthers uh, in late 1960s, early 70s. Why don't you tell us about what was the conditions and what caused you to even join the Black Panther Party? Well, to be honest with you, Kamal, you know, I really have to go back to my own consciousness, level of consciousness that I grew up with. And I grew up in a, in a household where uh, consciousness was, was there, Black consciousness was there. My mom, as, as a young teenager uh, mother, well, she used to be a, an African dancer, right? She taught, she learned African dancing. She used to teach that to my sister and myself, African dance. <clears throat> and one of the things she she learned, and one thing she taught my sister and I, that we're Africans, mm. right? I grew up with the idea that we we're African. I never grew up with the idea of being a Negro or being a, a colored person or whatever kind of derogatory names that it was named black people at that time, all right? So my consciousness began with my mom, at the foot of my mom, right, with the idea that we are Africans. In high school, uh, I was going to high school, I became a, a Black Student Union uh, a chairperson, a leader in Black Student Union, and uh, 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 fighting for Black Studies uh, when they didn't have Black Studies, you know, back in, back in the days. So we organized for Black Studies in our, in our high school. One of the things that came, uh, uh, was important to me, right, uh, helped my, in my own development and influence was, I used to be good in, in school, I was good in school. You know, school was never a problem for me. However, math, one of the things that I love, I used to get tutored. And one of the persons who used to tutor me was, was John Carlos. John Carlos, uh, yeah. some of you may know, was the iconic, Latina iconic photo of him and Tommy Smith at the Olympics, uh, uh, 1968 Olympics, mm -hmm. with the fist up in the air. Mm -hmm. right? Well, he was one of my tutors, right? And so I grew up in that kind of era 
uh, of people engaged in, in struggle, engaged in, in, in support of black ideas, of black liberation, uh, of black thought, right? Uh, and so I was sort of, always had been in support of that kind of thinking at that time. Uh, when I was 15, my mom, uh, for my 15th birthday, she bought me a conga drum, right? That was my 15th birthday. And I learned how to play the congas. I was involved in a group called the Afro Brotherhood, right? And that's my cultural nationalist days. All right, when I was actually into the idea of being uh, um, uh, that cultural nationalism was was going to be a, a form of liberation, it was where the, the boobas and the dashikis and, and mm-hmm. the bees and, and the dark glasses and, and play the conga drum, you know, the whole idea. Trying to learn some Swahili was unable to do so because <clears throat> uh, you know we didn't even have no teachers or anything like that, you know, mm-hmm. learning off learning off the cuff. But um, when I saw uh, the Black Panthers, uh, I think it was in 1968. Uh, going to Sacramento uh, to fight against the Mumford Act, mm-hmm. uh, which was when Reagan was the president of, uh, of uh, was the president, was the governor mm-hmm. of California. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he tried to prevent us from carrying weapons. At the time, the law was that we had open carrying, like they have in some states today. But when the Panthers was open carrying, they wanted to change the law. So they changed the law, and it was called the Mumford Act. And so the Panthers went to Albany, I went to uh, Albany, went to Sacramento, the capital of Sacramento, carrying their weapons to oppose the, the implementing of the, the Mumford Act. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, I said, these are some black guys that I want to be a part of, right? Now, I had some, some familiarity with them because I had some old elementary schools had become Panthers. But, you know, I was still like my culture nationalist ideas at the time. Uh, but when I saw what they were doing, I told my mom, I said, yo, mom, I want to be like them guys. She said, no, nah, man, that's not <laughs> happening, right? Because she's in some Martin Luther King, you know, uh, civil rights and, you know, nonviolent stuff. But for me, that was, of course, generation, being young, right? You want to look for those more militant, more active individuals about the people, about the work. And so that was the first part, the first time that I really looked at them with a critical eye and said I want to be a part of it. Uh, soon thereafter, when I turned 18 years old, that's when I actually joined the Black Panther Party. I became actually an active member of the Black Panther Party. I actually joined when I was 16. I signed up for when I was 16. Uh, but I actually became an active uh, uh, member of the Black Panther Party when I turned 18 years old in, uh, in San Francisco. So you, so you, uh, uh, you turned 18, you become an active member, and uh, one year later, you have charges being brought up on and you're, you're headed to prison. Tell, tell yeah, us. That's a fact. Yeah. One thing we got to understand about the Black Panther Party, remember the original name of it was? Black, Black Panther, Panther Party for Self-Defense. Self-defense. Right. That's a fact. All right? Mm-hmm. And so the whole idea of the Black Panther Party was they going to defend the community, one thing about against police brutality, right? But they also defend the community against hunger. They defend the community against uh, uh, un- uh, being unhoused. Mm-hmm. They defend the community against the issues of, of uh, uh, being uh, uh, sent to prison, mass incarceration. And we didn't know that, that name at that time, but that was, that was what was going on. Right, they defended the community against uh, uh, health care, right? they created health clinics uh, in, in the community. But more important, in as, as important as those things, they also defended our community against police violence and police brutality, something that is continuing today. Uh, so uh, I joined the Black Panther Party when I was 18 years old, and soon thereafter, because of my um, audacity, you might say, mm-hmm. or uh, naiv- naivety, you might even say, right, I was recruited into the Black Underground. Now, keep in mind also that the Black Panther Party, from its origins in 1966, October of 1966, that uh, Bobby Seals and Huey P. Newton had already incorporated within the Black Panther Party for self-defense the idea that there will be a revolutionary underground movement, a revolutionary organization. So rule number six of the Black Panther Party was that no Black Panther Party member can join any other organization but the Black Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. That's rule number six. So that was part of the inception of the party from Jump Street. Right, but then uh, COINTELPRO, not COINTELPRO, LEAA, the Law Enforcement Administration, Association Administration, or something like that. I read in one of their documents, in one of their papers, that in 1968, when they had a riot down in Mexico and uh, the police killed a bunch of uh, protesters down there, one of the individuals down there had in his pocket a letter where it had the name on it, Black Liberation Army. Now, whether or not the Black Liberation Army was in existence back then or not, we really don't know. Right, but according to the LA, LE, LEAA report, there was somebody down there had that name on a piece of paper in their pocket who got murdered down in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Mexico. 
and that was 1968. So, <clears throat> so the Black Liberation Army has always been an indelible part of the the uh, 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 inception of the Black Panther Party, and I was recruited into the BLA uh, in my early years of uh, 18 years ago, going on 19. Yeah. So we're going we're going to take our first break, and we come back. We're going to talk to Jaleel about his time in prison and what he thinks about what's happening in the movement today. We'll be back on Renegade Culture. Black out. Man, this is Raheem Shabazz, man. I just want to give a big shout out, man, to Renegade Culture on their 100th episode. Can you believe that? A whole bunch of renegades made it to a 100 episode of their podcast. That's monumental. Hey, yo, man, the renegade culture family, man, is like the Wu-Tang Clan, man. You got Minister Server over there. You got Kamal. Then you got my man Kalanji Changa, man. He's like the old dirty bastard over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yo, man, tune in, man. Check that out, man. Marcy Lee here, co-host of the Necessary Blackness podcast. I want to send love and congratulations to the fam over at the Renegade Culture podcast on your 100th episode. And here's to many, many more. Peace. Welcome, Renegade Culture. We back again. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Episode 100. That's right. On the strength. With our guest, Jaleel Muta King. That's For right. First podcast in the First, we got the exclusive. Okay, you know what I'm saying? When he went in, there wasn't no damn podcast. I don't think there was. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so he come out and he rolled with renegade culture. Wasn't a lot of things, no cell phones, no, cell no phone. cable. None you know of that saying? ice cream he was eating a few months ago. None of that ice cream he was having, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? saying? <laughs> a lot of things changed. But anyway, uh, Jalil, I mean, you know, we, we, we mentioned that you were part of New York 3, right? And then yeah. people in the audience, they like, man, is that a rap group? Is it a Sugar Hill Gang? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is it Run DMC? Who's the New York Three? Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So um, can you explain who and what the New York Three was and how it came about? Yeah. Um, on August uh, 21st, no, August 28th, 1971, uh, myself and uh, Sheikh Noah, uh, Noah Washington, Albert Washington, uh, uh, his now ancestor, Mm -hmm. uh, he died in prison in 2000 for a uh, cancer. Uh, we were arrested uh, in a uh, 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 an arrest. Uh, they in, we had <clears throat> a shootout with the police, right? Uh, they tried to arrest us. We we shot it out with them. We got captured, and uh, it was due to uh, they alleged that we got in the shootout because uh, we was attempting to retaliate for the death of uh, of, of George Jackson. Mm -hmm. George Jackson was murdered on August 21st, 1971, and we were arrested on August 28th, 1971. Um, uh, and so, as, as, as a result of that arrest, they alleged that we had weapons that was engaged or involved in the case in uh, May of 1971 in New York, uh, the, the killing of uh, two police officers. And as a result of that, <clears throat> uh, we were tried uh, for, for, that, for, the, for those murders. And it uh, resulted in our being in prison, and I stayed in prison for 49 years, going on mm. almost 50 years as a result of this case. Wow. Now, 50 yeah. years. I, I, I mean, you, you basically spent your whole entire adult life locked behind bars in maximum security prison. Um, and obviously, you got a lot of support from outside. But can, it's a broad question, but can you talk a little bit about what the experience of prison in that long is like and how you survived, you know, intact, strong, with your politics intact, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just say this here. Prison ain't for, for the weak, mm. right? Uh, but I also want to say this also. Prison ain't no place for one to seek to go to either, all right? Especially for the young kids in, uh, out there uh, uh, involved in these gangs and you know, street organizations so forth and so on and have no disregard for other people's lives. Or even for their own, in, in that in that respect, uh, prison is not a place for you to get your your your, your street cred, right? Uh, prison is a place where you are actually being exploited uh, by the system. Okay, <clears throat> so in my understanding, because I was political before I went into prison, I remained to be political while I was in prison. Uh, I re became a, a organizer while I was in prison for for the most part. Uh, I started the first. Uh, 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 revolutionary uh, national newspaper, prison newspaper called Army Spirit, uh, while I was in San Quentin prison. I started the first, uh, it was the first march 
organized the first march on uh, uh, on uh, uh, Washington D.C. Uh, and and also uh, started the first uh, had the first petition ever submitted to the United Nations by prisoners that was heard by members of the, of the United Nations. Hmm. Uh, was a, a UN prisoners uh, 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 petition campaign in regards to political prisoners. First time the issue was political prisoners ever brought to the United Nations. I organized that. Um, and also in, in 1998, I started the first uh, a national organization called Jericho Movement. It was also of, a, of uh, having people uh, march, what we call the Jericho March, uh, to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, in, in respect to the issues of the existence of political prisoners. Uh, Jericho now exists, have been existing for going on to over 20 years, right? I was co-founder of Jericho along with my sister Sophia Bukhari and my dear brother Baba Herman Ferguson. Mm -hmm. uh, God bless uh, rest, rest, they rest in peace. Uh, both of them, they were the ancestors. And so I'm the only living co-founder of the Jericho Movement, uh, founding of co-founder co of the Jericho Movement today. And so uh, we'll find that for me, uh, prison was just an extension of the community mm. in, in, in terms of my organizing and, and trying to deal with the issues of it being in prison and recognizing that there's a, a system system that created conditions for our people, particularly black and brown people, to be sent in prison in mass, right, in mass. And so uh, all the time when I was in prison, I organized, I used to teach black history classes, I used to teach sociology classes, I used to teach poetry classes, uh, and I used to organize. Uh, so uh, that's how I survived prison. I survived prison by continuing to uh, live the spirit uh, of, of the party, live the spirit of the movement, uh, and being of service uh, to our people inside and outside of prison. That's how I survived it. You know, we've spoken to a number of different uh, uh, former political prisoners. You know what I mean? Um, we've, uh, you know, in our travels, just working with folks like uh, Robert King Wilkinson from uh, uh, down in uh, Louisiana. You know, of course, Daruba and, and so many others who came out, Marshall Wade Conway, folks like that. Uh, uh, the, the folks from uh, the MOVE organization, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. You know, you had, you know, you've seen folks like, like you said, Albert Noah Washington, you know, uh, um, and uh, Hugo Yogi Pinnell, who was assassinated a few years ago during Black August. For you to come out 49 years intact, man, we, we I mean, there should have been a ticker tape parade. I'm talking about folks should have been singing in the streets because of the fact that for all practical purposes, you were down longer than Mandela. Mm -hmm. You no, know what I'm saying? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and to come out intact, man, it, it's like, man, I mean, you know, this, this show is usually lighthearted, you know, but um, I feel your spirit, you know what I'm saying? Well, let, we, me, let me say something about that, uh, just, just pointing, because I've been asked that question many times, <clears throat> and my answer to that question is here. They have my body in prison, but never had my soul and my, and my mind in prison. Indeed. My soul and my mind has always been on the streets. Word. I always try to find out some kind of way how I can be of service to our community, right, while I was in prison. So when they released me, only they did was synchronize my body where my soul and mind had always been. Mm -hmm. And I was out here with, with, in, the, in the community. Yeah. So that's, that's my answer to that. Yeah. That's how I survived this prison. And, and you had it because of the fact for us, our organization, um, We're Own Liberator is one of our mandatory political education books. You know what I mean? So, so it's, 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 yeah, you, you were here. You know what I'm saying? But just to, to be able to say, okay, boom, you out of that, out of, uh, 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 out of, uh, uh, I don't want to say general population, you yeah. out of solitary confinement because you're still in general population out here with us. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? From maximum security to the minimum security. I'm in minimum security yeah, now. Right, we yeah. still are, are under, the, under the condition of still uh, racist repression. True indeed. Question, um, you talked about San Quentin. Your case was out of New York. Now you weren't a federal prisoner. How, how did that thing work out? How'd you end up in California from New York? I was extradited. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they said that the case, the case evolved in New York, so they extradited me. Uh, in uh, 1972, they extradited from California to New York. <clears throat> I stood trial for three years. The first trial was a hung jury, <coughs> excuse me, in favor of uh, acquittal. The second trial, they did some, some shenanigans mm -hmm. and uh, um, I got it convicted. Originally, it was five of us. But uh, two of us was dismissed in the case and returned to New York three in the second trial. And uh, uh, the three of us, the, uh, the three uh, black uh, guys who was involved in this case, were convicted. And, um, and after my conviction, they sent me back to California to finish the time they had to do in California. 
1977, I was released from California, parole from California, brought me back to New York. And then I started this, uh, the bid in, in New York. And I was released in October 20th, October 7th, 2020. Uh, so that's all together to 1971 to October 20, 2020. October 7th, 2020 is about 49 uh, okay. years and a couple of months. Okay. And you, you were re released when? What, when was that? Uh, when October. were you released? October, October 7th, okay. 2020. Now, yeah. is, I, you can update us on what's happening in terms of this on, does, because after you were released and paroled, uh, there's been an ongoing case. You just had a press conference a few weeks ago uh, around, uh, around them trying to get you back in. And, and because, you know, over the, the many decades of struggle to get you out, obviously the New York State Parole Board, the governor, they've all been against your release, the attorney general. And finally, obviously during this pandemic, uh, you were released, and obviously a lot of that also came uh, with the struggle of people who were by your side over, again, many decades. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what life has been out like for you out on the outside? And again, as much as you can, talk about like this pending case uh, that's happening now and any support that can be given to you. Sure, absolutely. Let me begin by saying that uh, I was originally uh, <clears throat> up for parole in 2002. I just want to be uh, became a, uh, uh, eligible to be released on parole. It was in 2002, and they kept denying me, kept denying me, kept denying me. Every two years they would hit me and deny me for a release from prison. Uh, in uh, 2020, I, I got COVID. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to make an effort to have me released from prison prior to uh, COVID, me catching being infected by COVID, and the judge had ruled for my be granted release. I uh, granted uh, uh, released on, on habeas corpus, <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, uh, Tish James, uh, Attorney General of the uh, um, New of York the State, New York State, State uh, denied my or, or challenged uh, the, the courts, uh, the judges uh, permitted me to be released prior to me catching COVID. Uh, and during the interim of she appealing that decision, I caught COVID, mm -hmm. and um, I got it bad, you know. Uh, they had me in the hospital for five days. Took me up to Albany Medical Center for five days and kept me on oxygen. Uh, they shut my shut me up with all kinds of drugs, you know, all kinds of experimental stuff. Some drugs that 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 that, uh, that white supremacist who was in the White House, uh, 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 Trump, mm -hmm. said he got. I got that all those drugs long before he did. As a matter of <laughs> fact, I was the first person in New York State to receive those drugs. Mm. Uh, uh, the the Minosphere, Resetafir, all kinds of stuff. Right, uh, blood plasma, the whole bit, and in order to save me, and they did. Right, Albany Medical Center, kudos to you. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, they saved me. I was returned back to uh, the institution uh, after five, after six days. Was returned back to the Sullivan Correctional Facility, and uh, I think it was uh, five months later, I went to the Pro Board, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I was eventually granted release uh, on parole, and. Uh, so that, that's how I, I was able to, get, to win my release as a result of continuing to fight. And actually, the people uh, supported me uh, over the years, and they continue to support me. So upon my release, uh, there was a group of uh, individuals here in Rochester, where I now live, uh, that gave me a very soft landing in, in my release. Uh, I was really appreciative of the support that I received from the community. Mm. Uh, they have an organization here called uh, um, Free the People, right? There was an option for Black Lives Matter. And they uh, really accepted me into their community, and which and I am extremely grateful. However, as a result of my release, there's one this one pundit guy named Bob Lonsberry, mm -hmm. who uh, was uh, upset by the fact that this guy who was used to be a Black Panther Party member uh, was uh, living in the Rochester area, and so he went on a rampage mm -hmm. about my being released, and he caused the uh, Republican. Uh, representative in this area uh, to uh, challenge my release. Now, why did they challenge my release? Well, I was released on October 7th, uh, 2020. I went to see my parole officer. My parole officer suggested I go to the Department of Social Services and uh, um, uh, see about getting some benefits, right? And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So I went over to the Department of Social Services to take care of some business, uh, uh, check out some, uh, 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 some papers, the, and they allege, they allege that I uh, filed some papers or signed some papers that 
saying that I registered to vote. All right. And as a result of that, their, their allegation was that I committed voter fraud. Mm. And so they gave me uh, two uh, charges, two felony charges <laughs> and, uh, and, and a misdemeanor charge. And those charges still hanging over my head uh, to this very day. Damn. Uh, as a result of uh, uh, being handed some papers uh, by the people who work uh, at the Department of Social Services and they're filling out these documents. Uh, not knowing the, the extent of these documents or uh, how they uh, work for me or work against me, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They allege that <clears throat> that what I did was uh, 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 they allege that what I did was uh, voter fraud. Mm. Uh, what is noted, what should be noted, is that in the state, in the history of the New York State, and all people who ever made an error on these those type of documents, not one single person, not one individual has ever been charged with a crime. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. We, we're listening to renegade culture, listening to Jalil Muta King, uh, former political prisoner who's locked up uh, for 49 years. He's been out a little over four months. Yeah. And we have him here live on Renegade Culture. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's uh, man, I, I'm stunned yeah, because yeah. of the fact that the whole thing on the voter fraud and all of that, I mean, they, they, they try anything. They pull up the sidewalk to make you taller, the whole nine, anything to, uh, you know, to bag you. So this is, uh, you know, when, when you think, for the listeners, when you think that, uh, when you set out and you say you're against the state, you know what I mean, it's for life. You know what I mean? I think that a lot of these new cats that's on the scene, they think they could jump in and out like they're playing double dutch. But yeah. let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say something about what you just said. You said that I'm against the state. Not necessarily so. I'm for black people. Mm -hmm. I'm for people of color. Right. I'm for depressed people. Right? That's what I'm for. It's not what I'm against. That's the problem. It's what I'm for. Yeah, that's and I saying. think that's the kind of idea, that's the kind of thing that we should try to engender amongst people. Right? right? Mm -hmm. And not so much about what we are against. Mm -hmm. It's about what we are for. True. And you know, we're, about, we're, about, we're about our human rights. Yeah. Right. We're about civil rights. Yeah. We're about what is equitable and equal. Mm -hmm. We're about equal rights. And right? Jaleel, so it's what I'm for is a problem. It's not for what I'm against. I'm sorry about that. On that note, what we're going to do is take our last break and come back because we want to get into what you think about what's happening in the movement today and your ideas about how we can move forward when we come back on Renegade Culture. No doubt. Renegade Culture. Black Eye. What's happening, y'all? It's Dr. Dia, founder of the Hype Movement. And today I am celebrating 100 episodes of Renegade Culture Podcast. Congratulations to Kalanji, Kamal, Ear Doctor, Minister Server, and the whole entire crew. Everybody who makes the show happen from week to week. Congratulations on this huge milestone. Continue being a voice of the people, bringing a message of liberation. I appreciate you guys for what you do. I salute you. Again, congratulations on 100 episodes of Renegade Culture Podcast. Peace. Yo, 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 this is Rob Stars from Rebel Diaz sending big love, you know what I'm saying, revolutionary salute to the brothers at the Renegade Culture Podcast, you know what I'm saying, celebrating a hundredth episode, y'all, you know what I'm saying? Make sure y'all tune in, get some of that Renegade Culture, y'all. Peace. Yo, it's Renegade Culture, and we back, back, back. Okay. And we black, black, yeah, black. black. That's for you, Jaleel, you know what I'm saying? Hey, yo, <laughs> Count like Kamau is back. Oh, my Anyway, <laughs> all that, we back, back, and blah, blah. Anyway, we live with uh, Jaleel Muta King again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, today, you, you, you've, uh, like you said, you've been down damn near half a century as far as your physical, as you pointed out earlier. Um, we want to know, like, you come out and it's a whole new quote-unquote movement going on. The folks in the street. You got COVID's in full effect. You got uh, Black Lives Matter. You got uh, 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 All Lives Matter, No Lives Matter, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and all that type stuff going on. Um, what's your thoughts when you, you hit the ground? And I already knew you, were, you had your finger on the post of everything that was going on anyway. But hitting the ground, coming out here right now, What's your thoughts on quote unquote today's movement and what, what's missing? Whoa, that's a big question. Uh, what's missing is the question of organization and leadership. Mm. And what's missing is the question of unity and uniformity. What's missing is an idea that we can, in fact, be our own liberators. Uh, that's what's missing. And because uh, we don't have the kind of organization, the structure, or the ideological foundation that is, that is well embedded in our communities, then our people has been, for the most part, uh, suffering from the ills of, of COINTELPRO, right? the destruction of a movement 
back in the in, in the sixties and and seventies. Uh, we have not recovered uh, from that from that destruction, uh, from the, that type of level of police repression or uh, government repression. And as a result, we continue to be ones who have been traumatized not only from the days of slavery to the present, but we've been traumatized by the kinds of repression that we have suffered uh, ever since. So the, every time there uh, a, there is a killing of a young black man or a young black woman, there's a trauma in our community. Mm -hmm. Every time there is this unlawful arrest and conviction of people of our, of, our, of our community, that's trauma in our community. And so we have to figure out ways how to deal with that, that trauma. And the only ways we can do, do that and, 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 and recover from that is to engage in struggle, right? And so <clears throat> that is the point where we need to move forward today. Uh, we need to reestablish a, some unity, uh, some national unity, uh, an ideological foundation that is uh, co 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 coherent and uh, consistent with our history of struggle. Um, we need to build a, a movement uh, that is not a trend like the social, social black consciousness movement of Black Lives Matter. That's what I consider it to be, a social uh, consciousness movement. Uh, not too much different than the uh, the Black Conscious Movement of uh, of uh, um, South Africa, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that's basically what it is. And and I'm I'm grateful for the idea that they have come to existence to raise some degree of consciousness and understanding uh, of the level of oppression that Black people suffer in this country. But in terms of building an organization that will move towards uh, any degree of independence or liberation. Uh, they're not the ones. They're not doing it. Uh, yeah. I don't believe they even have the idea of doing it. Hmm. I mean, it feels uh, so like that it's a is social the element in, in regards to our overall struggle. But I can appreciate Black Lives Matter, uh, the, that all the trends mm -hmm. and tendencies, uh, because they have a, a degree by which they uh, uh, raise consciousness, mm -hmm. and 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 and, 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 and in, in some ways uh, create some levels of self pride or Black pride, you know, uh, and recognize that we do value, have value, you know. Uh, in this culture, uh, so that in that in that way, uh, I am supportive of Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. but I think that in regards to moving forward, uh, they have to make a, another transition uh, in regards to uh, what they really intend to achieve as an organization. Wait a second. So I'm concerned about what is going going to go forward, how we're going to move forward, and yeah. building something substantial uh, that's going to be uh, in, in essence institutionalized. And move towards independence and, and liberation. So, Jaleel, so when we had we had say Kuo Dingo on a few months ago too, and he gave a similar answer. Like he was, he said he was happier. You know, he's he's, he's happy that they're there than than not per se. But there's not the type of grassroots organizing that folks like you and him and others did back in the day, where folks were in the community. Uh, there seems to be more lobbying, more policy work, more electoral work, particularly at the national level. But, you know, so what's your thoughts on uh, the idea that, you know, folks are not on the ground, really. You know, folks are not necessarily making connections on the street level and doing that kind of street organizing that pays dividends because that's the folks who, like, you know, you need to politicize and work with and bring into these organizations. Yeah, well, we have today what we call the, uh, the, the, uh, the nonprofit industry, mm -hmm. right, who are actually uh, um, uh, funding progressive movements in this country. And because they are funding uh, these progressive movements in their own uh, "quote unquote" neoliberalism, uh -huh. uh, have a way of controlling how these organizations are, are, are moved, uh, how they operate in, in our community, and so that's a problem that we have to uh, have to address. Uh, we need to find some way how to become self-sufficient in our, in our own uh, organizing and become independent in our own organizing. We need to develop our own benefactors uh, to support our movement. We are not there yet. Uh, there are a lot of black millionaires and billionaires, uh, or a few billionaires, uh, not many, uh, black millionaires and billionaires in, in this country who are not necessarily supportive of our own liberation because they invested into the capitalist system in and of itself, right? and they, that's their bread and butter. But unfortunately, we have to deal with that on some point right? in terms of our own class struggle within the national liberation movement, all right? and we have to address those issues. And so by that is the issue that we really have to address at some point. Uh, yes, we need to go back to the kind of organizations that were existed in the Black Panther Party, where the Black Panther Party had self-help programs, uh, the kind of programs where he, at that time they called uh, uh, a survival pending revolution, right? Uh, we need to develop uh, health clinics in our own community. We need to develop free breakfast programs in our own community.
We need to develop uh, kinds of tenant strike and tenant uh, support base in our communities. And if we can develop those kind of structural organizations, structural uh, uh, development in terms of organization, what I call decolonization programs, if we can build decolonization programs, decolonize our mind, decolonize our thinking in terms of our relationship with one another, that we can be independent and self-sufficient, we create autonomous regions, uh, then I think we can build a movement that will be substantial and significant in regards to challenging the type of uh, moribund, moribund ills that we are facing uh, due to the fact of uh, the kind of hierarchy, hierarchical government that we are, uh, the white supremacist government that we are now uh, uh, under. So uh, that's what we need to do. We need to create new structures and new institutions uh, that are de depend upon our own uh, um, capacity mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to to survive. I can. Um, you mentioned uh, Jericho movement earlier. You mentioned being one of the uh, the founders and the last uh, uh, living founder uh, or co-founder. Um, how can folks, uh, you know, support Jericho? And what are some of the things you're looking to see come out of? Uh, you know, the future of Jericho? Ah, very good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. At the moment, the Jericho uh, movement is moving towards what we call um, in the spirit of Nelson Mandela. It's a program that we have developed uh, as a basis of a, a call that I made when I was in a Southport Correctional Facility on the 24, 23-hour lockdown. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. I got, sent to, I got sent to Southport for teaching the Black History class when I was in Attica, and apparently they didn't like the things that I was saying. Because I was trying to be, create interdiction between the, the kind of bloodshed that was going on, the type of warfare that was going on between uh, the gangs, the street gangs in, in the prison system. And because I was making an argument that they, are, uh, they don't understand their history, uh, they locked me down for that. All right? and so I was in Southport, and I came up with the idea of, of uh, the Spirit of, Nelson Mandela, Spirit of Nelson Mandela movement, our campaign, and for the purpose of uh, having the international jurors to again come to the United States and discuss the issues of the existence of political prisoners and also to deal with the issues of genocide that we as people have been confronting uh, in the United States. Uh, this uh, October, uh, the Jericho Movement will be having a, what we call, International Tribunal 2021. And one of the things that we're doing in, in the spirit of Nelson Mandela is that we are raising and commemorating the recharge genocides, the 70th, and the 70th anniversary of recharge genocides uh, the first petition of submitted to the United Nations by the eminent uh, Paul Robeson and uh, uh, William Patterson. Mm -hmm. And so we are commemorating the 70th anniversary of that uh, by also calling the international jurors uh, to come to the United States and for us to bring to them another charge of recharge genocides. Uh, the condition that existed back in 1951 when Paul Robeson and William Patterson brought the issues of genocides uh, to the United Nations, they still exist today. Right, many of those conditions exist today, and so in our commemoration of that, we're raising these same issues to the international jurors, and we are intending to have our our our, our scholars and a legal team to present our argument uh, to the international jurors in October of 1970, uh, October of 2021, and we will, uh, as a result of that uh, uh, um, decision by the international jurors. Uh, we intend to file a federal petition in the federal courts, mm -hmm. the federal district courts, raising the questions uh, that was presented to the international jurors and with their decision and hopefully with the support of the international community, having brought our question, our issues to the international community of the issues of uh, our concerns of what we say is that we are charging genocide. We bring, bring them to the federal court for the purpose of the United States government to address those issues. They would have to answer them. And then we have to answer them with the, with the basis of support that we have obtained from the international community. We are moving forward in support of our, our people and our liberation and independence on the basis of uh, understanding that the conditions that we are suffering here in the United States are intolerable, right? When we have 70 million people that voted for a white supremacist to be uh, as president of the United States, mm -hmm. out of that 70 million, we can expect that there's probably 30 million more, right, that we don't even know about. Right, there's seven million that we do know about, mm -hmm. and so in that understanding of the conditions that we are suffering under, of the conditions that we are confronting in the United States, don't seem like they're going to go away anytime soon. That's true. Right? That's true. I think black, white people need to get in, get in touch with their own base and deal with white people. You know, we can't fight white supremacy. Mm -hmm. White people got to fight white supremacy. Mm -hmm. All right, it's their uncles, their brothers, their sisters who run around with the Confederate flag and and tearing down tearing down the Capitol building. 
All right? And so that's not black people's struggle. Our struggle is that when we are, are confronted by white supremacy, when we are disempowered by white supremacy, we need to defend ourselves against white supremacy. All right? But it's not us to go to white people and tell white people stop being racist. All right? That's it's right. white people need to tell white people to stop being racist. That's their business. That's their struggle. Yeah. Right? What we need to do is get away from them. Right? Yeah. Divorce ourselves from them. That's our golden objective. Mm -hmm. All right? And we need to figure out ways how we can depend upon ourselves for ourselves and for our own liberation and independence. That's the only way that we're going to be able to survive this madness. Right? We've been suffering from it for the last 450 years, right? And it ain't changed, right? Uh, and every time we get progress, mm -hmm. they try to knock us back, right? What happened with Obama uh, was backlash, right? What we find with Trump, all right? And that's not nothing new. That's right. In, 2000, in, in, in 1920, was, well, in 1940, there was 20,000 Klansmen, right, dressed, right, marching in Washington, right? So what we find with the, the Proud Boys and, and uh, whatever they call them guys doing, talking about uh, 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 we're going to take back, make America uh, mm -hmm. great again. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing all over again, right? Yeah, yeah. After the pandemic in, in 1918, as another example, after the pandemic in 1918, what happened? You had the Red Summer, mm. right? White folks going crazy, mm. right? Uh, uh, killing the black people in, in Chicago and Detroit, right? Uh, leading up to 1925, uh, when they burned up Tulsa, Tulsa uh, uh, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. right? So after this pandemic, what we can expect? I don't know. Will it be a return of the same thing? Will it be a return of uh, 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 a history repeating itself? If we haven't learned the lessons from back in 1920 and 1925, then what are the lessons that we're finding today? All right, so right. I think there's a pattern that we really have to really step up and recognize that there's some, some serious uh, issues that we have to confront amongst ourselves and within ourselves in dealing with the issues of this country. Uh, so in uh, October 1920, October 1920, October 2021, right, uh, Jericho Movement, where we're bringing the issues of recharge genocide with the international jurists, mm -hmm. and we will hopefully bring up our questions, of our issues, into the international community. Uh, uh, Malcolm once said that our struggle is not a civil rights struggle, it's a human rights struggle. That's right. And on That's the basis right. of that alone, we are raising our question to the human rights, mm -hmm. to the international community in October of 1920, uh, in October of 2021. Jaleel Duantekin, thank you so, I mean, Jaleel's on fire. He comes yeah. out, he's on fire. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He's doing that work. So we got one light question for you. You've been out for four months. What's the best thing about being out? Being with my mama and my kids. Ah, oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, I mean, you, was, you locked up for 49 years. You come out, you're looking better than Kalanji ever looked. You know what I'm saying, hey, brother? Man, so, you know, you know, what, I'm know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, so, hey, you right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I thought Kamal was locked up for 49. I had to look at the thing. I'm like, who are you talking about here? You know what I'm saying? Brother Jaleel, we want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, again, original Black Panther Party member, uh, uh, part of the Black Underground. Uh, locked up for 49 years, former political prisoner, a true hero of our struggle, Jaleel Montekin. Thank you so much for coming on. No doubt. Salute. Uh, we appreciate you. Renegade Culture will be back next with our, our musical guest in a second. Bam. No doubt. Get the Misfit up next. Yo, peace and respect. John Robinson here. I want to give a major salute and congratulations to the Renegade Culture podcast, the 100th episode. <laughs> salute to y'all brothers. I see y'all working. You know, um, you've been holding it down over there, keeping your ears to the street, letting the people know what's going on in the world from all aspects and sectors of life. And, you know, I love the variety. I love the fact that there's a humorous element to it. You know, y'all be going at each other. <laughs> I love all of that because it's real, right? It's organic. But I just wanted to send a quick salute. Keep doing your thing. Keep shining. Yo, much love, respect, John Robinson. Peace. Saturday Renegade coaches in the building. Yeah, yeah. Yo, we just Hot had a show tonight. Oh, yes, yeah, right, man. We just had a great show. We have brother Jaleel Montekin on, you know what I'm saying? Former okay. political prisoner, Black Panther Party member, Black Liberation Army. It was fantastic to have that brother on. Yo, man, and this has been the 100th episode. That's right. We can't forget Centennial. that. Centennial. I'm, I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm really juiced right now because of the fact that, you know, that, that I remember episode one. I know, I know. Coming up in that joint. And I remember episode two, too, man. You had some whack dude come through, but that's another story. Oh. But anyway. <laughs> Still one of the highest rated shows we've ever had. It is. You know what I'm saying? That brother came on and talked about socialism and stuff like that. He, he was, was pretty he, good. He, he, he was, was good. talking like, like Mike Tyson, but he came through looking like ski bowl from the West Coast. Oh, but it was all good. <laughs> <laughs> what we doing now, man? What we doing now? Anyway, we're going to skip to the musical guest. We all have right. a musical guest. It's uh, brother right here. He's from Mississippi. 
Ah, oh, that's it. right. All right. I mean, first of all, I live in Mississippi. Out. You live in Mississippi? Two Jackson, Jackson, that's right. That's right. Shout Spe- out to Mississippi. Spell always- it. Huh? Jack, spell it. M I S S I S S I P P I. Oh, yeah. oh, my bad. Any you can't you can't spell. bitch. Oh, well, there you go. You got to lay it on. You got to lay it on. You're not from Mississippi. Right, that's right. That's how we know you're not from Mississippi. Oh, God damn. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, God damn. Word. Shout out to all the cats we know from Mississippi. The crooked letter. No crooked letter. No crooked letter. That's how you do it. I'm talking about St. Ives. So good. Gotta say the crooked letter. No crooked letter. No humpback. Okay, all right. Come out. Come out. Introduce our guests. Introduce our Anyway. Brothers from Mississippi, from Macon, Mississippi. Oh. Right? Yes, sir. Um, this brother right here, man, he's uh, a crooner. Oh. He's a young brother because mm-hmm. of the fact that, you know, I heard about some of his influences and whatnot. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We're going to definitely yeah. get to that. But, um, you know, he's a hot new artist. You know what I'm saying? He's on the movement records. He has mm-hmm. an EP dropping February 14th. Well, all right. Which is Sunday. Valentine's Day. Yes. I um, saw the tie-in. There I, you go. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't celebrate Valentine's Day, but you know what I'm saying? We're anti-capitalists up in this motherfucker. <laughs> nobody so loves it. <laughs> that means he can, that's the way he's saying he got no money to get nobody <laughs> no presents. So we're expecting, so we're expecting nothing. All right. And nobody hey. loves you. <laughs> but listen, but, but on the real, though, I'm happy that you and Naka will be together. For <laughs> anyway, so. I love so, you, man. I love you. So, <laughs> anyway, this brother right here has a new EP. It's called... Baggage, baggage claim. claim, yes, sir. Tell us about baggage claim. Brother. First, baggage claim. Can, can you, can you tell the name? artist the name? The artist's name, brother. <laughs> oh. He did this every show. My bad. Every, every show. show. Every anyway, show. Anyway, I got interrupted by these two weirdos. <laughs> anyway, we have Ken the Misfit in the building. Ken. Ken. All right. Exclusive. Exclusive. You know what I'm saying? All right. You heard him here first. Mm-hmm. Ken the Misfit. Baggage claim. You know what yes, I'm saying? Sir. Tell us about baggage claim, man. Uh, debut EP. Um, is basically. I guess the best way to summarize it is like the progression of, of, of a relationship. You know, like we go from strangers to lovers and then, you know, strangers again. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 a, it's basically claim your baggage. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is my stuff. This is your stuff. Like, let's claim my shit and, yeah. you know, take these lemons and make lemonade. <laughs> Wait, the way you said that, it sounds like it was filled with sorrow. Yeah. It said, you know, uh, strangers. Mm-hmm. Lovers mm-hmm. and strangers again. And you got that coon of voice, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, know what I'm saying? <laughs> you about to sing the answer. You know what I'm saying? You're about to <laughs> bam. So that, that sounds like a hardcore joint. I, I got the opportunity um, to go in the studio and check out some of oh, cool. the, the uh, uh, pieces that they have coming out. It's going it's, it's going to be a, uh, you know, a hard body joint. All right, you know all right, all right. You got some dope videos as well. Um, so who are some of your influences, man? Like, how'd you come up with this thing? Oh, um... I'd have to say uh, Music Soul Child, of course. Music Soul Child. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Kim Burrell. Kim Burrell. Yeah. Um, okay. And Brandy Norwood. <laughs> like, okay. Okay. they just great at what they do, all of them. I really think great you, at what they do. You, you're probably the first artist that I've seen come on here and say Music Soul Child. As a, as a <laughs> yeah, musical influence, mm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, I've never heard anybody talk about Cockroach <laughs> from the Cosby Show. Oh, <laughs> man, man music, come music, on. Music, I'm just saying, I mean. Man, come on. For those of y'all that watched the Cosby Show, it was Cockroach, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Am I wrong? Man, then, you can't then, do my guy like that. I mean, you, okay. can't, you can't do my guy okay. like that. Okay, what was his name on Martin? You can't do my guy what, like was that. was his Cockroach? It was Cockroach. No, no he wasn't Cockroach. No, it was Tommy and... Tom. Cold, 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 yeah. cold, cold soul child. Cold soul child. So when, I, when I first saw him, I'm like, look at cold, cold child. child. Like, yeah. Cold child. They both about two feet not, tall and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? A foot so, and a half. Man, y'all not finna do my guy like that. Oh, we like, 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 we Man, I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. It's what you know, it was my launch pad to get me here. Word, word. Launch pad to get you from from Macon, Mississippi to Atlanta, Georgia. That's a serious thing. I always uh, salute brothers and sisters from Mississippi because of the fact that you know coming from where we come from up north. I mean, Mississippi is like like hell to us. Yeah. Every time I drive through Mississippi, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, look, you ain't going to motherfucking speed limit going through Mississippi. Yeah. I'm, I'm with a cat. And I, we, we went through Mississippi one time with the Ruba going to show too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, I was scared to death. He was going like 110 miles an hour. Yeah, who was you scared of in Mississippi? Man, Come on, man. You know I'm, they still got that I'm, rap. They man, still got listen, that rap. man. We scared of what we might have to do to one of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, a lot of strange like, fruit in uh, man, Mississippi. Man. Fruit. Ain't you know, it never man. happened to me out there. Nothing ever happened to you? I don't know. I, they, they, I don't know. I probably look scary or something. I don't know. Ain't it never happened to you? Okay, okay. Ain't never happened to me. Yo, so... One thing that we do on our shows, we do a bold question. A bold, bold question. We do a bold okay. question. It's called, called knock is nonsense. Knock is nonsense. Okay, okay. And so we, you know, we got a hundred 
questions in here, right? It looks like 200. Shut up, man. It's like 100 questions in here, mm -hmm. right? So you want right, you to right. pick one question <laughs> that you've never seen before. Right, okay. right. All right, all right. Obviously. And then you, uh, shh. Brother, don't, don't give up the gig. Don't say. <laughs> um, so we're going to pass it over to you to, to pick a question for us. Okay. 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 Knock the nonsense. The bowl is back. The bowl. He glued it back that's together. A, yeah, that's ah. a cheap bowl. A lot of questions. Candy dish. I don't know where you get it from, bro. This man got a lot so of questions. I need to like shuffle them up. Shuffle them up. Shuffle them up. Dig deep, brother. Dig deep. Yeah. Okay. Deep. All right, all right. <laughs> don't break that bowl, man. Don't break that bowl, though. You know what I'm saying? That's a, an exclusive collection. We're, we're the charge Take the bowl back, brother. Take the okay. bowl back. All right, brother. All right. Read that question. And we apologize for Naka's handwriting even beforehand. Yes. It might be, yeah, it's kind of braille, so you might have rubbed your fingers. Like the miseducation of the Negro. It's just based on him. <laughs> Old Mississippi Old Negro. Mississippi. <laughs> scenario. Okay. All right. Scenario. Scenario. All right. This is funny. This is funny. Okay. Okay. Scenario. You don't eat pork. Nope. You okay. travel to an African village. The whole village honors you, sits you down, and offers you food with pork in it. What do you do? <laughs> eat it or refuse it? Okay. First all right. of all, I, I mean, let me just say before you answer. You going to let him answer before no, you No, not about that. I just, I mean, question, the, I just want to, you know, the characterization of the question is sort of like <laughs> American attitude about whether or not Africans, Africans eat pork left right. and right. They're not, you know, less right. the, the Muslims and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So... Just let you know that. For that ain't people. got nothing to do with it, man. Let him answer I, the I, question. No, I just was right. saying for your for your edification, because you're ignorant. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, brother. What you, what you think? Were well, you going to eat that pork, or are you going to insult the entire village entire, and say no? The entire village of Because you have of a family and shit. habits. You know what? Listen. What you going to do? I'm just going to be real with y'all. What you going to okay, do? Okay. I'm going to have to eat that pork. Cause okay. I don't listen, right. this, and this is why. This is why. Cause, Cause you know, you really eat pork on the look. I, I don't want to. And you got to look for like, I got no problem with it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I think I do it because uh, you know. First of all, you from Mississippi? I'm from Mississippi. Okay. I, I don't speak a single African language, so I don't even know how to tell them. Like, listen, y'all, <laughs> this ain't that. I don't know. I'm just had to go, and then I'm still like a. I'm outnumbered. Like, God, I'm in God a foreign damn, country. Man. I'm out. No, not doing it. So yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm gonna have to eat the. Eat the swine, man. Yeah, eat the swine, eat man. the swine, deal with the consequences later. Be a good dignitary. Okay, okay. There you go. Ambassador there you go. of a culture. You know what I'm saying? And, and help support and eat that swine. In the name, in the name of that. diplomacy. Spoken like, in the name of diplomacy. <laughs> Spoken like a true fan of Cold Child. Cold Child. Music Cold Child. Music Cold Child. Right. Oh. Come out, come out, speaks Haitian. It's a, it's a last week. Don't even try to understand. Don't even worry about it. We're going to we gonna edit that out, I baby. wanted to hear it. I was about to say, go. Oh, Listen. no, no, brother. I'm, I'm with you. I would, I would eat the food. You're yeah, dignitary. Eat the pork, you're, man. you're supporting other people. You're out there for a reason. You're probably supporting something on the, or that's a little bigger than that. So that's I, what you do. I, yeah. so, so what if you was allergic to it? You still eat it? You're like, fuck it, I'm going nah, to die in the motherland. I can't die in the name of diplomacy. No, I'm going to die in the name of diplomacy? I'm going to have to pass. I'm going to have to pass. That's what black folks do in the name of America. So, yo, when we come back, yo, <laughs> we're going to have Ken, the Misfit. What's the song you're going to sing for us? It's called Drugs. See, drugs. Now, that's oh, why. See, that's why. Drugs. Okay. Now, this, this is why he's going to eat this shit. Because he's going to be hiding than the motherfucker in this African country. <laughs> And he's he like, nigga, I got the munchies. Uh, but he's that her. I'm eating this pork. You get high enough, it don't even matter. There you so go. We're going to okay. come back with drugs. Y'all want renegade culture. We be back. Black oh. out. I ain't never been high like this. I don't even want to come down. Kind of figure from the first hit that it wouldn't be the last time. I'm always feel like I always need it. Always thinking about it when I don't. I keep telling myself I start over tomorrow, but we both know that I won't. Cause every every drug is the next best, it's the next best, it's the next best. Hey, hey, it's the next best, it's the next best to you. Pills can't give me the feeling, and the weed can't give me your high. Cause every drug is a is the next best to you. If you gon' keep on supplying that shit. Then I'm probably gone OD Cause I can't ever get enough of it You got me feeling like you own me Whoa, whoa, But I kind of love it like I need it And I'm always thinking about some more I keep telling myself I start over tomorrow But we both know that I won't Every drug is the next best It's the next best It's the next best Hey, hey It's the next best It's the next best to you Pills can't give me the feeling, and the weed can't give me your high. Cause every drug is a, is the next best to you. They say that I may need some help. I put 
my common sense up on the shelf. That thing you do, you know you do it well. And I'm relapsing, here I go again. Yeah. Every drug is the next best, it's the next best, it's the next best. Hey, it's the next best, it's the next best to you. Is the next best to you Look at me, I think I need some help They say I put my common sense up on a shelf That thing you do, you know you do it well I'm relapsing, here I go again Every drug is a Every drug is the next best, is the next best, is the next best, hey, is the next best, is the next best to you, oh, pills can't give me the feeling, we can't give me your high, cause every drug is the next best to you. Where you at? Where you at? You. Shout out to Renegade Culture. Thank y'all so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Word up. Yeah. No shit. <coughs> I'm Ken the Misfit. Baggage claim. February 14. Block out. All right. So good shit, man. Happy <laughs> 100th episode of Renegade Culture. Yeah.